Uh, but praise the Lord, we're in church this morning, I believe, on time. On, we're in the right place at the right time, doing the right things with the right people. And I'm telling you, this morning, uh, I'm so stirred in my heart, and I'm excited to share with you. And I wouldn't even say I'm excited. I feel um, what I'm going to be sharing this morning is so vital, not just for this, just for this house, but also uh, for so many, for the church. And, um, and so even online, you might be out at home uh, watching online. Hopefully, you maybe invite some friends. You can share this message. Um, it, it's definitely going to be a straightforward message. Um, very, very straightforward. But I think it's something that uh, it's going to cause you and I, uh, what's, it's going to give you and I the ability to stand. It's going to give you and I the ability to stand. And uh, the Bible tells, tells us over and over that we're going to, there, there is a way that we can stand, and right now, so much of the church and so much uh, of the people of God, and even, I mean, the people of God, just even those that are not going to a church, or they are the church, but they're not planted in the house of the Lord, and, and they've even, you know, what it says, uh, they're, they're just kind of, uh, they've, Christ has found them, but they're not actively following Christ, okay? That, that's possibility, Okay. But this is a word for, for all of us, and it's it, it, for uh, being able to continue to stand. And many times we don't stand, and we don't even know what to stand uh, against and stand for because we don't know God's word. And I'd say this, just because you've heard it doesn't mean you know it. Knowing God's word, in order to know God's word, you have to be able to receive God's word. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to be starting a, a series called Foundations, Building uh, Strong uh, with the Lord. And, uh, and we're going to be talking about that in the next coming weeks. But before I jump into that foundational, the, huh? Siri, sorry, I, I, she's here. Praise the Lord. Okay. It's on silent too. Here. Uh, no, I'll keep it right here. Maybe she'll want to talk again. I was like, what is that? That was interesting. But before we jump into this, this series, Foundations, Building Strong with God, I want to, um, I want to, I want to go back uh, to the last two things that the Lord spoke very clearly to us as a church, and I shared them with you um, at the beginning or at the end of this last year. And I'll go to, to these two, two passages. Zechariah, chapter 4, um, I would just go right to verse uh, 6. Uh, and seven, and I'm going to go ahead and look it up because I wanted to read it out of the Amplified this morning. Zechariah, somebody say Zechariah. It's one of those that's kind of hard to get to in your Bible. Okay, come on, get there. There it is. All right, Zechariah chapter four, and I shared along these lines, and I shared it with the leadership of our church as well. Um, matter of fact. Uh, that was what we ended up giving to the leadership of our church, a, a Christmas gift of olive oil out of this verse. Um, but that it would not be by might, uh, not by power, but by his spirit. This is Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. And there was a vision that was given to Zerubbabel, which was the one that was in charge of building the temple. And so I want to liken it like this, like building the church. And the task that was in front of him, you know, um, seems very difficult. And he had a vision. The Lord showed him uh, there, there would be this picture of these two olive trees. And these olive trees would produce right into a bowl with no human extraction of the olive or processing to produce oil. These olive trees would have a never-ending supply to the lamp, to the church, to the light. A never-ending supply from God in this season, in this time. And it would be for the building of the, that temple or, and I would say this as the building of the church. And he said, uh, this is the word of the Lord to you, Zerubbabel, or to you, the church, those that are called to build. How many of you know we have, our, we have an assignment? The church has an assignment. And that's to make disciples, okay? Um, and, and make followers of Christ, to, to preach the word, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We have something to say. I'm going to tell you that again. You have something to say, and it's the gospel. And we have to know what to, we, we have to use our voice and stand for the gospel, okay? 
All right, he go, but he says this, he says this, and so what's going to happen, he said, uh, this building of the temple, it's not by might, it's not by your own power. Sometimes you feel helpless when things are too big or too heavy or you don't know what to do, but how many of you know when you can put your confidence and strength in, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's what he said in verse 6, but I, I wanted you to see this uh, in the next verse, uh, verse 7, and I just find this so this is one of the verses that I highlighted on to us as a church, or the Lord highlighted on to me, and I communicated it through, is that what are you, verse 7, this is out of Amplified, what are you, O great mountain of human obstacles? <laughs> Before the Zerubbabel, okay? Uh, he goes on to say this, you shall become a mere plain or a molehill, and he shall bring forth the finishing stone, he shall, he shall complete. There will be a completing of the building, of the house. Perfect, entire, lacking nothing. This is the, one of the words of the Lord. And the next one we, we came into as the approach of this year it, it, is this, and it would be easy as one, two, three. Come on, come on. Wait, it's Matthew 1, 2, 3. It would be a good way for you to remember maybe. Um, Michael Jackson, it's Matthew 1, 2, 3. Um, and this is our approach this year. You ready for it? Matthew 1, 23. <laughs> Behold, a virgin shall right, be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name what? Which is? That's our approach. That's our approach right now. This year, God with you. What you'll find if you begin to look through the, through the word, you're going to see that uh, be strong and very courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. You're going to find that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. If God be with us, if God be for us, then who, what could, I'm telling you, you're going to see, if you look in the word, when God is with you, there is nothing that can stand before you, and God with you brings about a courage to stand. And having done all to stand, stand, therefore, the Bible tells us, and this is out of Ephesians chapter 6. And talking about Ephesians 6, if you have your Bibles, I'm, here's the deal. It's not if you have your Bibles anymore. You need your Bibles or you, you need a notepad. You need, and this is, a, uh, this is I'm, what I'm talking about this morning, is very much a corrective word. And you're going to see this here in a moment. But you, you got to have the word of God in order to stand. Listen, <clears throat> how many of you are going to jump out of a plane not, with a parachute um, not checking again that it's secured. Anybody? No. You're going to make sure, or if you're on a ropes course, you're going to make sure that the, the, the carabiner is clipped and latched, and you're going to check it two or three times before you step out, right? Because you want to know. Trust is based upon what you know, what you've held again, not what you knew, well, not what you've heard. Not what you want. Yeah, I think it's, uh, how many of you ever have done this? Yeah, I think I hooked the trailer up. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Pull over. The chains are dragging. Hey, raise your show of hands if, you, if anybody has ever began driving without the trailer being fully latched or fully hooked. Raise your hand. Dangerous, isn't it? Thank God. I, I've seen it come undone and have the chains hooked, but it, the, it never got latched. This stuff happens. Listen, we go through life so often based upon what we knew, and what we knew doesn't hold us. Trust. Hebrews, he tells us that there is a way that we, you and I can harden and fall away from what we once held true and knew. In Hebrews chapter 3, he tells us don't fall away to what, that, that what you once held, the truth of God's word that was committed to you by Jesus Christ himself. He, if you read Hebrews chapter 1 all the way through, maybe 7, it's, it's amazing. I've been spending some time there that he says, hey, Moses had a message committed to him by angels, but the message that was given to you was by given to you by none other than Jesus Christ himself. But it's possible if you don't hold to his words that you could fall from or walk away from trusting in him because it will be what you knew, not what you know, and therefore will move from, from trust, what I know, what I trust, 
to reason because I thought I knew that, but this is what I see now, and therefore now I've walked with God long enough that I no longer trust Him. I move from trust to reason because I no longer operate with what I know because I knew something, and now I know based on what I see and based on what I feel, and so let's just grab a hold of that apple, and that's better preaching than you could ever, I'm telling you. It's so easy for it to happen in the church. Now, why I said get your Bibles out, Ephesians chapter 6 is, it tells us this, that having done all the stand, stand therefore, having gird yourself with the word. The strength to stand is huge, not only hugely, it, it's only possible. I, I didn't say height. I, I didn't say weather, weather as in weather the storm. I said stand. I said stand like as in a lighthouse in a storm. See, a lighthouse doesn't weather the storm. The lighthouse shines in the storm. But if we're to, we- if we're to stand, we're gonna have, it's going to be because the word of God is in us. Because the word of God is, not, is held by us. Guys, like never before, you got to know what you believe. This is why we're t- starting this series called Foundations. And we're going to lay again the found- some of the most simple foundations. One of the, I don't have time to go there yet. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to just re- hit a couple of things. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians 6. And I'm not going to take time to... Uh, Take time to read all of the, the passages, but season 610, be strong in the power of the Lord and the power of his might, okay? So it's not your strength, it's his strength. The armor is, it's the armor. It's his strength. It's what he's given you. And he goes on to say, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against rulers of uh, darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And he says, therefore, or wherefore, take all uh, take apart the take on or put on you the whole armor of God that you be able to stand. And I want to jump down uh, to verse 18. Praying always. This is the very last. This is this is being the, uh, on the offense, not the defense. Okay. There's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The verse right before that. And then he says, praying always with all prayer of supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance. So he didn't say. Uh, pray once he said praying always and persevere in prayer if you don't know the word of God it's hard to pray the will of God I'll say that again if you don't know the word of God it's hard to pray the will of God and then you're going to be found in James chapter 4 where uh, why is there all this strife and all these things among you is it because you want but you cannot obtain you lust after these things, and you have not because you ask not, or you do ask, but you ask amiss that you would, you're asking according to your own will, and that you would be able to fulfill it upon your own desires. How many of you know this is, if you don't know the will of God, the word of God, you can't pray the will of God. If you don't know the word of God, you can't pray the will of God. If you don't know the word of God, you can't play the will of God. Ask anything according to my will, and it will be done. And when it's not done, when you pray, you can stand there and you can persevere and and faith and patience can work and you will be there perfect, entire, lacking nothing. That's also James. Because you have his will. Why do you have his will? You're praying according to his will because you have his word. And when you have his word, his word brings with it all the provision necessary to perform. God's word brings with it all the provision necessary to perform concerning your finances, concerning your health, concerning your peace, concerning everything, the word. But the question is, will you and I let the word work? Will we be bold enough to allow the word to work or to stand with the word? What's said right next after he says pray and persevere, he says this, and pray for me that utterance may be given unto me to declare 
just with exactly the right words so that I don't offend somebody. Somebody put that up. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19. And the utterance may be given unto me, to you and me, that we would be able to declare boldly. I didn't say uh, smash somebody in the head and be a jerk. I didn't say declare your righteousness before somebody. I said that we would boldly proclaim what? The gospel. Here's the deal. So much of what, as this is straight for everyone. So much of what the church communicates today is communicated out of pride because the church has not learned, especially in the last 30, 40 years, has not lived under the authority of God. And so our, because we're not living under the authority of God, we're not living in a place of humility. And therefore, when I speak, what I carry is pride instead of humility, which also carries grace and has hindered the message. So here's what I'm about to tell you, to tell you this morning. The hindrance of the message is it isn't so much as Satan as it is the church itself. Correction starts in the house. If my people would humble themselves and pray, he would hear from heaven and hear their la- heal the land. So it starts in the house of God. And here's what I, I'm, I'm talking to you this morning, and I'm about here to talk about correction in the house. Now, this is laying the foundation to what we're going to get to in Hebrews. Um, Paul talks in the, to the church in Hebrews. He talks to the Here's the deal. The word of God is useful, the Bible tells us, for correction, for rebuke, for for encouragement, for all these things. But don't you dare take it out, the correction out anymore. It's there. It's supposed to be corrective. Now, let's take a look at what God corrects. Okay? So cool. I love this. I'm, this is a very straightforward word, but here's what's so cool. God corrects carnality. Carnal. You know, carnal is just flesh. What, what I want. Ah, you know, it could be addiction. It could be ah, gossip. It could be got to say what I got to say. It could be pornography. It could be whatever. I mean, carnal. Okay? So God corrects through his word carnality. We're going to look at that. But he also corrects the church, the, those that would be, um, have walked with God, and maybe, maybe you don't really struggle with, I don't know, whatever it might be, but he, the word also corrects apathy, both carnality and apathy, and we hear the word, but we're indifferent, and we make no change. To hear the word and not make the adjustment is so not just apathetic, it's actually pathetic. (laughs) For you and I to take my word over the word of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, for me to take what I think and what I know and my reasoning over his word is ridiculous. And this is what he, the word of God corrects. Now, I want you to see this, and we're going to look at both the church that's apathetic. I mean, listen to this. Uh, this is not in my notes, but let's just go ahead and go to Revelation chapter 3. You've heard this scripture, um, which talks about, because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. This is, he's talking about an apathetic church. He says, I'm good. This church says, oh, we're good. But listen to what he says. You, you say, I'm rich. Uh, and I and I increase with goods, and I have need of nothing. Do you not know how wretched and miserable and poor you are? And he says, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. But let's go on to the next verse, because I think this is so, so huge and so key. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase, chasten to be zealous, therefore, and repent. He says, I stand at the door and knock. Every time the word of God is spoken, God accompanies his word. And he knocks on the door of our heart. This is a corrective word. But see, here's what correction is. Correction is simply pointing in the right direction. 
Correction, so many times when we think about the Word of God as correction, we have this picture of our teacher, maybe just this is, and this red marker that's wrong, 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 you suck. <laughs> Failure, you're never going to get it right. Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? I can't believe you're doing that again. What, what's your problem? Don't you know better? See, this is Genesis chapter 3. It was this guy. It was this woman you gave, you gave me. <laughs> it was her. This is not correction. Correction is, hey guys, it's this way. That's what correction is. Oh, don't cast any stones. Finish the story and go and sin no more. But that takes a um, boldness. It takes guts to stand and be able to say, listen, and you know what was so awesome? It was noisy. How many of you know it's noisy? How many of you know it's noisy now? Okay? And James, he tells us that there's a wisdom that's, that's, not, that's from heaven, and that wisdom is peaceful. It's, it's, it, let's go, oh, thank you, Lord. Let's go there real quick. Well, we, we went to Revelation 3. We saw that he, he corrects those that he loves, right? Now let's go, to, um, let's go to James real quick and see that this wisdom that comes about and that's spoken, Ephesians, or not Ephesians, but James chapter 3, just let's go ahead and read 13 through uh, 16. He says, who is wise among you? Right before this, he's talking about the power of the tongue. He says, who's wise among you? Let him show forth it with, with his tongue or the way he speaks. Okay? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness or humility and wisdom. Listen, you will not be able to speak with humility unless you live in a place under the authority of the word of God. To carry authority, you have to be under authority, okay? But if you have, here's what he says, but if you're angry or if you have bitterness and envy and strife or contention, warring against, like king on the mountain, who's right, in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth, okay? Assess where you're at before you speak is what he's saying. Don't. If, if what I'm about to speak is going to come from a place of anger, I need to take a, 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 play, a, a, a page out of the playbook of Jesus when it was crazy in the crowd and kneel down and wait. In other words, come to the throne and wait until the wisdom that he says, that the, he says, the wisdom that descends from above is earthly and sensual, and it's envy and strife, and that brings with it confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and is without hypocrisy or is real. And that wisdom brings with it the fruits of righteousness. When it's loud, take a knee and wait until what you say can be heard in a whisper. It was crazy. Who's going to throw the stone? Da -da -da, da -da -da -da. He just bent down. Everybody was just waiting to see what he had to say. I don't think he said it like this. He probably said it like this. Hey, uh, if you're without sin, go ahead and cast the first stone. And quietly, people that were standing, filled with rage, dropped the stone and walked away. Because a soft answer does turn away wrath. But, a so, but, but, but the wisdom of God doesn't just turn old things away. It turns people to. And he stood. And the wisdom from above was not weak. 
but it presented the gospel and it declared this is the way. It didn't say, put some clothes on you, piece of trash. It said, where are your accusers? I don't accuse you. Well, how could he even say that? Because he said that he came as a man and was therefore tempted in every way, even as we were tempted, so that he can understand in our weaknesses and therefore present a case to the Father. So don't point a finger. Instead, point to him. Instead, remember what he said and and wait until you can whisper so it can be heard. But don't be so weak as to omit the only thing that can produce what would set them free, which is the word, the seed, the gospel that has the ability to produce and allow them the freedom to walk in a place that doesn't produce death and all of, that's what sin does. Don't omit it. Go ahead and throw up Revelation 21.8. I didn't give you that verse either. I want you to read this this morning, and I'm gonna, I'll be willing to wait for Revelation 21, verse 8. And we're, then we're going to get into this, uh, just into the correction part here in a minute. It says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexual, immoral, those who practice magic, arts, or witchcraft, the idolaters, and all the liars, they will be consigned to the lake, uh, to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Isn't that sinner, all the sinners? You know, it's interesting. What is the first thing he mentions there? What does it look like to be a coward? To say nothing. To not be salt. To not be light. Here's the deal. It, in this season, um, you're gonna. You, what you see is Paul brings correction to the church, not to the world, but to the church. Paul brings correction. To the church. You know what? When you and I see this in the church, oh, let's go ahead and, oh, thank you, Lord. There's so much I I, I need to go to. There's so, okay, listen, Paul corrects in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He corrects and he talks about somebody that's committing, sleeping with, let me just go ahead and look there. It's, It's a memory, doesn't do it. Correction in the church is vital. And you know what? As a pastor, there's a grace to stand in that office. But oftentimes, the opposition, how many of you know the fight of faith? To walk with grace, you still have to fight the fight of faith. And so you have to fight that which would oppose. But there is a grace given to to a pastor to bring correction. Okay? Now listen. 1 Corinthians 5. It's reported commonly, okay, not just one person, but commonly that there's fornicators among you. And such fornication as is not so much named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up and have, uh, you, you, you're not, you, you, don't, you don't mourn about it. Grace. That he, have, he doesn't mourn that you've done this deed. Uh, he says, verily, verse 3, I, I, as absent in the body but present in the spirit, I have already judged. Don't judge me. Don't you know God? Don't judge. God doesn't judge. Help me out here. Don't judge me. God doesn't judge. No, but there was a grace given to a pastor to make a decree about what's going on as being wrong and evil. And there needs to be an adjustment. That's what the Bible says. Our scripture cannot be based upon culture. Culture is to be based upon scripture. Make the adjustment. The church in Ephesus had problems being drunk with wine. So you know what he said? Do not be drunk with wine, Ephesians 5.18, wherein with excess. But be filled with the Spirit. He's correcting carnality. 
And here he's correcting carnality in the church. Hey, it's wrong. It needs to quit. He goes on to say, uh, I'm absent, but I judge already as though I were present concerning him that does these kind of things. In the name of the Lord Jesus, when you gather together and my spirit with the power of the Lord Jesus, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, tell them the truth. The street corner, Turner Burn, is not the place for correction. But in the house of God, the word of God is useful for correction. And here's the thing about correction. If I'm going to advance and I'm going to make it to the mark where God ha has, has designed for me to reach, I can't make it there without course correction. It's impossible to advance in the kingdom of God without continual course correction. When you miss it, he's so faithful to show us. And when we miss it, and he's faithful to wash us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's faithful. But your and my decisions produce for you and me a result. There is no such thing as private sin. Personal, yes. Private, no. The church, the salt is the preserving agent in the world. The reason the world, what you see in is hell in a handbasket is because the church has not been the preserving agent in the world. Because the lack of correction in the house of God, I can do what I want. Listen, the word of God, he, he is a personal God, but, but this doesn't change. This doesn't change. He goes on to say this, look at, he says, uh, delivered such a one to Satan that you may be saved. Your glorying is not good. I'm good. You're glorying. You're, you're saying, I'm good. I don't have to make the adjustment. My indifference to the matter, to the word that's spoken, when I'm indifferent, that's me saying, I'm good. I'm glorying in what I'm doing my way. He says, it's not good. Know you not that a little leaven, leaven spoils the whole lump? In other words, that there's a fade, there's an effect. When you are infected, there, is, you, you, there becomes an effect to every area of your life. And just as in leaven in a lump, he says, purge out the old leaven. And he's talking to the church at Corinth. A church, and we're going to look at this here. Let me finish this, and then we'll talk about the church at Corinth, okay? Purge out the old leaven that, uh, that you may be a new lump. Or without, and as you are unleavened, for Christ is our Passover and is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven. Let's, in other words, let us enter this covenant, this communion with the Father, not in our old ways, but in a new way, in the way that He says. Let, let us, when you enter a covenant, all I have, all He has. So, all the power in heaven, God with us, I got it. But guess what? He's got. All of me. I am crucified in Christ. I don't live. It's Christ who lives in me. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, I will glorify God in my body, which is his. This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This is the word of God, and it has to be taught to the people of God. So in this earth, people would experience the fragrance of God. <sighs> Taste and see. What's that? It smells so good. <sighs> Taste and see. You and I, being the fragrance of God in the earth, causes people to come and taste and see. Let your, work, work, let your good deeds so shine before men that they would see them. That they would, what, what is that? Oh, I see what you, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Listen, keep on, let's go, keep going through verse, or chapter 5. Sometimes we just, we don't take time to discern what these things are saying. You know, we just read and we don't really look, okay? <clears> then <throat> he goes, therefore, let's hold this feast, verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company, keep company with fornicators, okay? Listen to this. Yet 
not altogether with the fornicators of the world or with the covetous or the extortioners or the idolaters, for then you would probably have to leave the world because it's everywhere, right? But everywhere. He said, I didn't say don't hang out with the world. Don't hang with the, he said, you'd have to leave the world. But I have written unto you to not keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. I didn't say fell. I said, that is what I do. This is how I live. Hey, I'm just coming to church. I'm a single man. All you single ladies. All you single ladies. All you single ladies. Oh, oh. And here in the church, there's a single man calling all the single ladies and everything's cool. Fornication. And we sit here on Sunday and everybody, people know or whatever. And nobody says Jack. And when it comes from the, in the word, well, we really don't want to touch fornication from the pulpit because that's kind of edgy. No, we have to touch fornication. We have to touch these things in the church. And as the church, the church is not a pastor. The church is the people. Correction should have in the church and with the church. The word of God, our conversations should be about the word. And living our lives in line with the word. Okay. Okay, let's see. He says, but now I've written unto you not to keep company uh, with that man. If any man is called a brother, be a fornicator or a covetous or a idolater. Uh, he says, with such do not eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? He says, in other words, don't judge those that are without, but within. Do not you judge them that are with, but you are to judge them that are within. But them that are without, God judges... Therefore, put away from yourselves those that are wicked. You know what wickedness is? is? It's simply unbelief. Wickedness is unbelief. Unwilling to receive what God has said over the way you think. Wickedness. Anytime the word of God is brought to me, and light shines, and I see something. It's not to condemn me, but it is for my advancement and to correct me and to point me further along upon the way and the path that God has for me and to fulfill the purpose that I would remain salt in this earth, be a preserving agent, and shine a light for others. That's what he's called us to do. Now, and I, I saw people getting up and all this kind of stuff. But you know what? With everything that's going on right now, I really don't care. I'm glad you came this morning. In 1 Corinthians, you'll see that Paul is talking to the church at Corinth. Now, I have this picture. I want you to see this. It's only going to take me about 15 more minutes to get to where I need to go. But I want you to see this. That dot right there is in the isthmus of the Corinth, it's this little, Isthmus simply means little land mass, a connection, a land bridge is what it means, okay? So there's a land bridge right there connecting all of Athens, all of Greece, okay, out here to this, this island of Greece, okay? Back then there wasn't interstates and highways and all this kind of stuff. That was, and now there's a canal that, for shipping in, in, at that little place right there, but before it was just this land bridge. So back in the day, there was a port on either side, Okay? Go ahead and show the next map and show you where it looks like in the Roman Empire, okay? So you can see it was a pretty, a pretty vital place, a location that you could go from one place to another and sail in, in the hidden area of the land to where you, to say, it would be a safe shipping route, it would be quick, it would be a shortcut, if you will, to all the other parts, really vital place. Well, <clears throat> when Rome was taken over, uh, this city was very strong and stood against stood against the Roman Empire. Well, Rome brought its, its force, its fury, down upon the city of Corinth and destroyed it, utterly destroyed it, and it laid in ruins for over 200 years. Okay? For oh, hundreds of years, this place just laid in ruins. But in, in, in AD 44, okay, Paul's missionary journey started in AD 45, okay? In AD 44, uh, Caesar, okay, Caesar decided, hey, guess what? we got to have that port. 
Matter of fact, we've got to have that port, and we've got to rebuild that port for us to continue our conquest. And in order to rebuild it, I'm going to, give, I'm going to dedicate this city to the goddess Aphrodite, which is the goddess of sex. I'll build a temple there, and the first people that come there, I will give them a portion of the, as the, of the land as founders of the city. Can you see why it would be important? So the people that came there with the ports on either side of the landmass from all over, the first people there would have been was the warriors and the shipping merchants. How many of you know, curse and drink like a sailor. This is the, and come to the whore, where, the, where just the goddess Aphrodite, which this Julius, this Caesar, he said he believed he was a descendant of that god. Okay? So here you have this sex city, this carnal city that has, it's filled. Uh, go ahead and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. And you can read along. But I want you to see right there, and he says, so this city is filled with carnality. And in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, this is a letter written to that church. A church that was founded in a place that was so carnal. It was dedicated, it had its roots and its foundation. There was a stronghold, to put it that way. Founded upon the selling of bodies. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not, he goes on to say this, wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, do not be deceived, neither the sexual or moral, the idolaters, the adulterers, idolatry, other God, adulterer, sex in marriage with another lady, okay? Uh, idolatry, or excuse me, go, ahead, go, go back real quick. Sexually immoral just simply means having sex even though you're not married, what, just because you can have sex outside of the bonds of marriage. So all these kinds of sex, adulterers, or men who have sex with men, homosexuality. Go on. Or thieves. How many of you know when they're at the beginning, thieves in this place, or the greedy, or drunk, no, or slanders, or swindlers, none of those are going to inherit the kingdom of God. If that's what defines you, go on to the next verse. And that is what some of you were. So what he just spoke of was the congregation of the church. He just spoke of the congregation of the church. I think I'm still speaking to the congregation of the church. Because of the, because of the land in which we're currently living. Maybe the first one doesn't apply to you. But I wonder about the, some of the ones in verse 10 that seem to be of less. He goes on to say, some of you, okay, yeah, okay, slanders. I, I've seen a lot of slander on, on the social media. Hey, just, I, I see it with church people, okay? So this is happening. He says, this is the describing the church. And this is why there's correction coming. You'll see all through the book, and I, I don't have time to go through all these different places. He corrects and he corrects. So good. Because he loves us. He corrects us. Because he loves me, he wants me to get to what he's designed for me. Because he loves me. And he says, oh, go to the next verse. And this is who you were. But, but, you were washed and you were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. This is what, the, what once defined you, but what now does define you is the blood of Jesus. Let that define you, is what he's saying. When it's named, when you see something among you, make the adjustment. Call truth, truth. Side with what God sides with. No longer can you and I remain impartial. Or whatever, it's good, we're good. Whatever God says. Apathetic. So we see this picture uh, of, of this correction all in, in Corinth. And I'm going to go ahead and give a few verses because maybe some of you all listen to this again or on your own study time. <clears throat> but you see that he talks about in 1 Corinthians um, I think this is so great. 1 Corinthians 3, he says, According to the grace that's given to me, I, Paul, lay a foundation. As, go ahead, let's do it. I have laid a, by the grace of God given to me, 
okay? I lay a foundation as a wide builder and someone else is building upon it, but each one should, should build with care. Next verse. For one, no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. This is the foundation. This is the way to the Father. This is the way. This is what you're going to have to hold to. This is not what you're going to just have to hold to, but this is what you're going to have to have doctrinally. Doctrine is not just what you believe, but it's what you communicate. Paul tells Timothy, guard your doctrine, because in doing so, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. Because doctrine, what you believe, if it's not what you communicate, it's not what you believe. What you believe, if you don't communicate it, you don't believe it. Paul says, I'll show you my faith. You say it by your say, what you say, I'll show you it by my works. In other words, there's an outworking, there's a coming. You say you have faith, I don't see the faith. I don't hear the faith. You say you got it, but I, there's no evidence. I'll show you it. Let's keep it back up there. According to the grace, he, he says, build, verse 11. No one can lay any foundation other than Jesus Christ. Verse 12. If anyone builds on this foundation using uh, on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown by what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed by fi with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Next verse. I think I had 14 on there. No, I didn't. 13, that's good. Let's leave it there. It's not about the size of the church. In this day and age, there's this temptation to be successful, to build a big house. Houses that go up fast don't last. But go, go drive through a neighborhood. You know those housing developments that just go, Brr! go look at the roof line. But when you have a wise master builder building, some building and laying, this is what I'm telling you guys, our, don't take the burden. Don't take the burden to cause people to come to Christ. He's building his church. But don't omit the duty sowing the seed of God's word and standing for Christ. Stand for Christ. I didn't say stand against people. Stand for. I'm not willing to fight with you. I will fight for Christ. And to fight for Christ also means this, fighting for policy. Church, if you hate politics, I will tell you this, grow up. Don't be apathetic. Don't be lazy. Get back in the fight for the kingdom. For Christ. I'm not going to fight with you, but I am going to fight for policy that says what God says. I'm not, here's the why I can say what God says. I'm coming under. When I come under, when I live a life, when you and me live a life, that's corrected by God the Father, I now carry the grace because I live in a place of humility and I can speak for Christ, I can speak with Christ, not against you, not against you, but I can stand for Him and for policy and for laws and use my, vo my voice for Christ and stand against principalities but I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to stand with you. And I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to stand with you, but I'm going to stand for Christ. He didn't say leave the world. He said stand for something. Stand for something. You know what I'm going to stand for? This as final authority in my life. Paul talked to the church at Corinth. Described a congregation that looks a lot like the congregations of the churches, but thank God for the blood of Christ.
It's also the place he told us what love is. 1 Corinthians 13. You can say all you want to say. You can speak like a tongue of men with it, you know, a tongue of angels. You can do all these good deeds. Hey, look at me. You can prophesy. You can have all the gifts and the God power of God. Because it was very prevalent in the grace, the gifts of the Spirit were very prevalent in the church at Corinth. So the gifts of God are not determined by your works, it's determined by God's work of righteousness, saved by grace. So even right now, the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the working of miracles, all those kind of things, those are available to you and me as the church when we stand for, when I say, I believe. This is what's happening right now, and I believe with all my heart that we're in, entering in a day of, of the greatest outpouring that we, the church has ever seen because of the simple fact that people are having to make a choice. What do you say? No longer is it going to be, well, whatever will be, will be. It's going to be, what do you say? Well, I say that Jesus is Christ. I say that he's the king. I, you're going to have to. You have to make up your mind. See, faith is simply agreeing with God. What do you say? And the gifts of the Spirit with it were at work in a very carnal place, a carnal church. And the Corinthians talks about it was happening because it was a gift. And they were given severally as He wills. You are carrying a gift from the Spirit of God, which is there to administer the love of God. You're carrying it. We're carrying it. Because of the blood of Jesus. And all I have to do to, to, to have access that is simply decide. What do I believe? Make a choice. Say who he is. Make a choice. Let this be final authority. This is why I want to get to Hebrews where he tells us in, in, in chapter 5 about how you can... Three, four, and five, how you can fall away and become athletic and no longer trust what you once trusted and not enter what God had prepared for you. Even though you saw the miracles, even though you saw all these things, you don't go into the promised land. You saw it all. But, but you've grown apathetic. And he says, I don't want to have to lay again a foundation, the foundation of, of, of repentance. There's six things we're going to talk about in the weeks to come. A foundation, and this will be, this is my opener for this, for this message. There's six things. Go ahead and put it up. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. There's six things. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary. If you were reading that in the King James, it would say the doctrinal teaching. The elementary doctrine, the beginning, the, the foundation. Let us move beyond that which is foundational. The elementary things, the one, two, threes about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. Not laying again the foundation, the sub-construction, that which you stand. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, there was a wind and there was a storm. The waters rose. The wind blew. The house stood. That's you. The temple of God in this land. A lighthouse. The house stood in the storm. The house stood. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. Because there was a foundation in which it held. And we're talking about a foundation. And this is the foundation. That, uh, not, he said, not laying this again. I don't want to. I want to move on. If God's willing, I'd like to move on. But not to lay again the foundation of repentance. So what's that mean? When you mess it, when you see it, you correct it. That leads to death. Repentance from acts that lead to death. And of, so that's number one, repentance. Number two would be faith in God. Faith in God, the character of God, the goodness of God. Number three would be this, instruction about clean, cleansing rights. I love that better in, in the King James. It talks about righteousness, cleansing right. That what you have because of righteousness. I don't want to have to talk about all that you have because of the right, of righteousness of God that comes from Christ Jesus. We need to move on, and we need to go out. Hebrew church, Hebrew church, those that knew what was right, 
knew about righteousness, knew about God, Elohim, but now they have a way because the Messiah has come. They believe that the Messiah made the way. They have all this foundation. But guys, it's time to go out. I don't want to have to lay again. Look at, listen, the laying on of hands. There's six things he mentions here that he calls elementary teaching. This is why inside of me there's very much a no concerning six foot distancing masks stay away don't touch if I was to walk down here and lay hands on people some people would be nervous because the foundation from which we've been building has been being built or has never had the stone of the foundation of the doctrine of laying on of hands that not just the pastor carries, but you carry, and you carry, and you carry. And if there's any sick among us, let them call for somebody, a, a growing person, but someone that's moved on to maturity of the church. Not just because you have a name on a parking spot or a chair, which we don't have, but because... Because you have a foundation that if there's somebody sick among you, I can lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Keep your distance. Don't come into the hospitals. What? Oh, but it's all for our good. It's all for our good. It's in a, these things, they're very much, we don't, we're indifferent. I'm not talking about being right. I'm asking what he said, what the Bible said, and what's being under attack. If your faith is not there, I'm not going to cause you to stumble. I'm gonna, if you're in a place, I'm not going to cause you to stumble. But my God, church. In the church, what are we carrying? A form? Or some power. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. You know why we don't receive some of the things? Because we don't believe it. Because we've what we once trusted, what we once only knew, is now what we only knew. Lay it again. Lay again the foundation, the doctrine of the laying on of hands. That's a doctrine, that's an elementary teaching that we should all hold. And just as real, look at the last one, as the rapture and heaven and hell is laying on of hands. Just as real. The Bible says. Uh, did, did you read this with me? Who was this written to? In the Hebrew church. You know what I love about the word? It speaks to everybody. You, you never arrive. We never arrive. But we're ever changed. As we behold what? More and the more of his image. More and the more of his image. And I'm closing with this. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to go through 1 through probably 7. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, His kindness, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. I beg of you, he says. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Next verse. And do not conform. Do not be molded by the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. You'll be able to, 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 to communicate God's will. You'll be able to stand for God's will. You can't stand for what you don't know. You can't pray the will of God if you don't know the word of God. No, long, no more than you can stand for the will of God unless you know the word of God or communicate his will 
It says, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Next verse. For by the grace given to me, Paul says again, there's a grace given to him. Let me tell you, there's a grace given to you. Okay? And for me to operate in your grace would be foolish because it's not what I carry. Let's, look, let's go on to see this. Because I want you to see, I want you to see that you don't have to try to operate in Pastor Nate's grace. But there is a grace for you, and you need to operate in it. Okay? One of the graces as a pastor is a corrective grace. As a shepherd, thy rod and thy staff, they're to comfort and bring correction. This is the work of a shepherd. Keep it up there. That's, that's part of the role of a shepherd. There's a grace there to communicate that, the, the love of God, the correction. But for by the grace given me, I say unto every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. And again, this would be if you go to Ephesians or Philippians chapter 4, where it talks about how let our meekness or our humility be known to all men. In other words, be humble. And he goes on to say, uh, rather you, in accordance with the faith God has distributed each of you. So there's something given to you. There is a word that God has given to you. There's a grace upon your life. Next verse. For each of us has one, uh, has one body with many members, and these members don't all have the same function. So don't try to act like the hand if you're the heart. Don't like, act like the lungs if you're the heart. Please, act, find out what God's graced you with. And look at here, it goes on to say, one body, one members belong to... So in Christ, we have one body, but yet many members, all these different... We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is to prophesy, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If your gift is to serve, then serve. If it's to teach, then teach. If it's whatever, if it's to encourage. Did you know that if you were to finish reading in James chapter 4, what the, this wisdom that comes from above, that's, that's first of all peaceful, listen to this, that produces a fruit of righteousness, which is what all of us are after, that so, somebody would come to know Christ. The fruit of righteousness is not your work, it's a work of God that came into your heart and you simply believed on Christ and righteousness came. But that comes from a seed that's sown, okay? A seed that's sown in the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is first of all pure or undefiled. It's then peace-loving and courteous, ye will, ye willing to yield to reason, full of compassion and good fruits. It's wholehearted, straightforward, unfaith, unfeigned or, or real. What he's saying is, there's all kind, the way that God's wisdom comes, it's so diverse. The wisdom of God carries with it the grace of God. Find out where your grace, stick in that grace. What you'll carry is with that a message of God wherever you go. Sometimes we think we got to say something because everybody else is. Well, just because the heart is beating doesn't mean you need to start doing this. In other words, what I'm saying is stick with your grace. If you don't know what to do, take a knee until you're ready to whisper. And you might find that that knee finds you serving, not saying. Stick with the grace. Stick with the grace. Stick with the grace. How do I stick with the grace? I stick with the grace and I get more grace when I humble myself and say, and not think of myself more highly than I ought, but I say, God, whatever gift you have for me, I want to give it. I want to give a gift. The grace will be there. God's grace is what saves people. Not you, not me. Grace is diverse. It, it's so diverse. It comes in the form of serving. It comes in the form of somebody saying what God says to them in prophecy. It comes in the form of all kinds of things. And they're given to you. There's a grace on your life. Listen, that grace, the Bible tells us that it's to be used in the church. Just as the grace or the, the function of the body in the church and as the church is to be used that way. The same way that the heart is used in the body and the lungs. Listen, this is why it's so important as you see the day approaching 
Don't neglect the assembly, but all the more gather together. Why? Because you get to exercise your grace. Exercising your grace is key for you to being able to have the strength to stand in the day and walk in the grace instead of addressing everything else through the wisdom that's not from above but is actually very earthly and sensual in nature. The church, the body of Christ, our assembly, it keeps us grounded. It keeps us grounded. Guys, we have to have a foundation. We have to have a foundation. And that foundation, the moment I begin to build contrary to the words of God and upon the words of man, I'm beginning to build my house on sand. We will not, not be able to stand in this season, in this time. What you and I need to do is not have mind over matter, but God's words over every matter. And until you have his word, shut your mouth because your words matter and there's a war going on. And so I would tell you this, get some words that you can keep to just talk all the time. God's faithful. Not one time have I seen, not one time have I seen the righteous forsaken. Not one time. That's what I know. Well, not one time. I know my God's causing all things to work together for good. That's what I know. That's what I know. That's what I'm going to declare over this nation. Thank you, Father. We, we are the light of the world, the city set up on this hill. That's my declaration over this, my family, over my mouth, over this nation. We are the light, the city set on the hill. What is the word of God over the matter? Let's say that. And let's allow this right here. This is the, this is the start of laying some foundation so that we're building strong with God and we can approach this year God with us. Let me tell you, if God's with you, tell me what could stand against you? Nothing. There's nothing too hard. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too scary when you have God with you. Let's get with Him. Amen? Amen. Uh, we're going to transition here. Thanks, guys. You guys. Keep on doing that. It's great. I love this. Um, but we're going to transition into just receiving our tithes and offerings uh, before we close. And I'm just going to, while you're doing that, I want to just make an announcement. And then um, Ms. Joni's going to give a couple announcements while you're giving and all that, and then she's going to dismiss. But here's the, the announcement while you're preparing your tithes and offerings. So cool. Um, right here. Got the numbers. Okay. Uh, we have, at the end of last year, uh, we didn't do like a, a celebration service like we have done in the past. We just said, you know what? We're just going to, we're going to and not take an offering on that day. We're just going to set before the church the carpet and the tile just to upgrade and as we're doing all this. And, and so we had a goal of like $30,000, $31,000. Um, and that was based upon an estimate uh, of the cost of carpet and the cost of tile. So, but we didn't want to run that into the new year as like a capital program or anything like that because we believe in stewardship in the house of God. Um, but we also believe in opportunities for somebody to get in on something just as David demonstrated to his men. He said, we're building the house of God. I'm going to give this. What are you going to give? Okay? So we believe in that. <clears throat> but here's what came in. Um, we had $22,500 come in of the 31000 Here's the coolest part, though. And that's so amazing. That's, that's really the coolest part. I mean, all of it's cool. But we have spent... 10500 on carpet, which is sitting in the lobby and the glue for this sanctuary. And we bought the tile for $3,000, which there's more tile than there is carpet. The craziest thing is, the coolest thing, the God thing is, we got the tile not for $2 a foot. We got it for $0.68 cents a foot. So, come on. So, we had a goal of 31000 We ended up have, raising twenty two five. We've spent just over 13, uh, 13, 8, and we have $8,799 to have the labor for laying the tile. So 
which uh, we've already contracted. We're somewhere in the neighborhoods of the $8,000 range, hopefully. We're hoping on the labor of the tile, which that other $800 will basically buy the thin set less maybe four or $500 of thin set. So we hit the goal. I mean, that's just so cool. And there was no, no pressure, no stress, no, none of that. It's just God's faithfulness. And, um, and in order to get tile at 68 cents a foot, it was just it's such a God thing. Because we're talking not a pallet, we're talking six pallets. No, eight pallets of tile. Eight pallets at that price of the same color lot, the same everything. So we're just so stinking excited. That's going to be starting being laid at the end of January, like in the middle of the late 20s. January 20-something, late 20s. Uh, working with the contract your schedules, okay? And then, <clears throat> um, but this next Sunday... We're going to start because we got to get the tile ready to lay, and we have tile that is in there, and the carpet. So this next Sunday, this is my announcement and before we give, is we're going to have a work day uh, on Sunday from 1 to 8, and then if you can on Monday, anybody that would sign up um, uh, from 8 to 8, we're going to go ahead and be working on laying the carpet. So the, on Sunday, we're going to tear out the carpet, and we'll pop a couple lines and get started on the carpet squares. They go fast, and we're going to be removing tile. So if you can carry... A tile with, with gloves, obviously. Um, if you can run a wheelbarrow or run a shop vac or whatever it might be, we would ask you to text uh, this number. Um, next verse, not verse. Oh yeah, there it is. Numbers. Next slide. Uh, four to seven nine five five one five to this number, and that would just sign you up to opt in. And if you could, when you sign in, you could actually text back that I could do the 17th from this time to this time. What that would allow us to do, after you text in, it'll send you a text back. If you'll just respond back with the time that you could be there, that would be super helpful. So if you can break out tile, love that. Uh, if you can rip out carpet, love that. If you can vacuum, we'd love that. And our goal is to have all of this re this removed and to have church. We will have church on that Wednesday. So I believe the carpet in the sanctuary will be done. Um, and all that tile will be busted out. I think all of it will be done Sunday. I think it's going to go really fast. It's, and you say that tile is a huge job. I get that. But most of the tile, 90% of the tile, 80% of it has a paper underlayment under it. So it should come off in sheets. So that's a blessing. So um, other than that, that's the announcement. So why don't we just uh, go ahead and uh, prepare to give. Let's just pray over our tithes and offerings. Father, we thank you. Just this today, <clears throat> as we give to you, and we just declare to you that you have our hearts. We're underneath of what you say. And we thank you that the plans that you have for us are so good that you said, and we say, that my God will supply all of my needs according to your riches and glory, not according to an economy, not according to what I see, but, Father, according to your supply. So right now we just say thank you for your supply. We just tear, we declare with our giving this morning, we trust you with all of our heart. Because you said where our treasure is, there our heart is also. We trust you with all of our heart. Thank you for your provision in every area of our life. We commit these tithes and these offerings to you. Father, to your work, to your service, and Father, we ask you for the wisdom to steward them, to carry out your plan in this earth for such a time as this. And Father, even just right now, I just re I release uh, my hand in agreement. Father, I thank you for the grace uh, to run this race today, in this time. You were born for this. You were born for this. You were born for this season. God has you here for a reason. You were born for this. You're strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Filled with joy and peace. In Jesus' name.